Uh, yes, I just uh, want to say a short welcome word to everybody. So thank you for joining BSA Online today. And today it's my pleasure to host Professor Tayana Simonich rosing from uh, uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, so Tayana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the work that my group has done in collaboration with a number of other groups and companies on HD computing and its applications. So as all of you know, uh, there is lots and lots of data that we're generating all the time. The amount of data has been exploding at annual growth rate of about 14%. And if we look at how uh, AI systems have developed, we had actually two phases of growth. Uh, first, we had a phase from 1960s up until 2012, with about two year doubling time in terms of size. And then we skyrocketed and went to 10x per year growth for the training in just the last decade. The problem is that compute has not kept up. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Compute has been stalling pretty rapidly, especially in the last decade, uh, where both the Nard scaling and Moore's law effectively ended. And this actually turns out is a huge problem because as the sizes of models are exploding, we're still relying on classical von Neumann computing infrastructure, which assumes that memory and processing need to be separate and therefore that we need to move data to the processor, which turns out is getting more and more expensive. So now a single move of data from main memory to CPU costs on the order of about 200 times more uh, than just processing directly on the CPU. This type of cost really causes huge problems with our performance. And in fact, as much as 90% of cost of data processing is today due to memory transfers. So one solution would be to move compute to data. And the idea here would be that we would want to accelerate processing in and near memory and storage. And my group had done a lot of early work in this area where we enhanced the CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and we also developed processing in memory accelerators which were capable of doing bitwise operations, search operations, and then basic arithmetic operations. And this essentially meant that we could do things like graph processing, database query processing, classification, clustering, uh, learning, security, multimedia, all, all inside of memory. Uh, <clears throat> and what I would like to show you on this next slide is uh, some of the nice work that a student of mine did, who is now faculty at UC Irvine, on accelerating uh, deep neural network training in floating point using processing in memory. Effectively, what we did is we took each layer of a neural network and mapped it onto a particular block in memory. That the uh, consecutive blocks were connected using specialized switching, which allowed us to move results from one layer to another very, very quickly. Inside of each block, we did a lot of row parallel operations. So both addition, multiplication, and also some nonlinear operations that are necessary when we do floating point training and inference for our deep neural networks. An end result was that our first deep neural network processing in memory accelerator was capable of both floating point training and inference, and it was 300 times faster than GPU. So in addition to solving the problem of this data movement by putting processing in memory and storage, an alternative way to solve the same problem is to really rethink the way we do the processing. So think about the algorithms that are better suited for hardware. And this is really the angle that my group took when it came to hyperdimensional computing. As you all know, human brain is really built for learning. I have four kids and I can tell you my kids never had to be taught how to find where I hide chocolate. There was no supervision needed and no training needed. And it is really kind of funny how much effort we have to put in today to do training and to prepare our machine learning systems for operation. And as you all know, also a lot of the work on brain inspired computing 
really came out of is what was motivated by what we observe in biology, where we can take dense input sensory signals, and those signals then get exploded into high dimensional sparse representation. So the idea is to encode this data into hypervectors instead of keeping them in real numbers or integers, depending on what it is we're using. These hypervectors may have thousands of bits. So here I'm showing a very simple example of encoding a black color and white color. And you can see that these two have very few bits that are similar. And so when we have a large number of bits that we encode data into, we get orthogonality for free, essentially. The other nice thing is that Penti Canerva, when he came up with this uh, design for HD computing, uh, he designed this full algebra that allowed us to work on really well-defined set of operations. And what's really important from hardware perspective is these operations are super easy to parallelize, which means that uh, this particular method is very easy to get to run in memory and in storage, which is really where we should be running most of our workloads these days. It also has a huge benefit of having very fast single pass training. Training really just involves addition, which is, and this addition is element wise. It also supports real time learning and reasoning, meaning that I can actually train and learn online because the operations are relatively simple. I don't need this complex system that I need with deep neural networks. It is also extremely energy efficient and robust to noise. Robustness to noise is a function of the size of the hypervectors and the type of noise that we want to tolerate, as I'll show you in a little bit. Energy efficiency we obtain by using extremely efficient hardware uh, acceleration. My group has worked for quite a while now on accelerating many different applications using hyperdimensional computing. This is just a small little subset that I'm listing here, but you can see that we have by and large gotten uh, accuracy that is comparable to state of the art, but generally much higher efficiencies for things like classification of images, of objects, for dealing with uh, uh, genomics. Uh, more recently, we have done some work on proteomics using HD computing. We have done work on speech recognition. We've done a lot of work on clustering. Um, we have some publications in regression, recent work with Intel on recommendation systems that show that we can use HD computing at scale of terabytes of data. Uh, we have done some early publications on reinforcement learning. We have actually a deployment on federated learning and I've worked on security, privacy, and other topics. And in the next slides, I'll touch on some examples of that. Just to quickly review, how does HD computing classification work? I have really cute pictures here of cats and dogs. In our family, we're actually uh, a dog family in that we own the dog. However, my daughters love kitties. So this is always a big issue in the family. You know, can we bring a kitty over? If we want to encode each of these images, what we would do is we would take the image and one way that we might encode might use each pixel uh, separately and would encode the address of the pixel and that address we would encode using what we call random projection encoding, which basically gives a random number to each location of the pixel. And then each color would be encoding by using what we called level uh, hypervectors, which for example, if we're using a grayscale, we would start with a random number that represents white and actually change those random numbers relatively in small increments up until we got to the black on the opposite end of the scale. This effectively would mean that very light gray would be much more similar to white than it would be to black. So combining this information together would allow us to generate a hypervector that represents, in this case, image of a dog. When we do training, we combine all of the hypervectors that represents each individual image in this top example of a cat into a version that represents all of these cats. So this is what I call cat class hypervector. We would do the same thing to get the dog class hypervector. And then for testing, we take the encoded hypervector and we would compare it to our already stored a class hypervectors representing cats and dogs. 
So in this example, all of these hypervectors are binary, which means that similarity check could be just a simple Hamming distance, which turns out is really easy to implement using even analog computing memory. Uh, the alternative, if we're using anything but binary, would be to use cosine similarity, which is also easy to do in memory by simply doing uh, matrix mo vector multiplication. If we want to do any kind of model adjustment online, we can use an algorithm that is very similar to simple perceptron adjustment. So here, we would look at a query, compare it to the classes. If we have an incorrect match, all we need to do is we need to subtract it from the incorrect class and add it back to the correct class. This is a very easy adjustment that can be done literally in a single cycle. Um, and this is partly why we can very easily do any kind of online learning and adjustment. We can also extract the data from hypervectors. This actually requires an iterative procedure, <laughs> which essentially relies on the fact that we have random base hypervectors, and then we iteratively try to minimize the error. I have to apologize, I have a bad cold. <laughs> Using the same idea, we can do clustering. So with clustering, we would start with assigning some hypervectors to be initial centroids, reforming clustering, and then picking the new centroids. And as we iterate <clears throat> on these centroids, what, once the difference between the current class centroids and the new one is small enough, we essentially get the cluster data. <laughs> and we have actually implemented both the standard k-means clustering as well as hierarchical clustering and a couple other uh, uh, clustering methods that are commonly used. More recently, we have used, for example, dbscan type clustering. <laughs> and this brings me to the very recent work <clears throat> that my student did I'm looking at how do we figure out exactly what size hypervectors we need. And we did this for different types of encoding methods, both random projection and <clears throat> what we call ID level encoding. And the long story short, the dimensionality D is really a strong function of the number of symbols that we're trying to resolve, the size of the alphabet, meaning what, what characteristics you have of the original data set, as well as the noise bandwidth, uh, which is represented here by omega. So the more noise you want to tolerate, the bigger the hypervector you need. And you can see here really nice results uh, that show that as we move signal to noise ratio from no noise down to large amounts of noise, you can see that HD computing classification essentially works nearly perfectly. It has almost no impact. In contrast to that, deep neural network on the same data set fails pretty miserably very quickly. <clears throat> Here you can see a little more details uh, comparing HD computing against uh, um, MLP, Perceptron, SVC, and LR. And you can see when there is no errors, we do just as well. However, when there is a larger bit error rate, such as three and a half percent, then HD computing is much better. And here is a table that actually quickly summarizes these results. You can see here that if we have large enough dimensionality, such as 10,000 bits, the amount of error in classification and clustering we get is very little, even in the face of large bit error rates. If we have smaller dimensionality, obviously the amount of error will be bigger. We wanted to uh, and do more detailed analysis on this. So what we did is we looked at different types of communication uh, scenarios. One is where you just transmit the raw data. So you take a sample and you send it through the standard uh, with standard modulation, channel encoding, and demodulation. And then on the far end, we used the HD classifier that did encoding and inference. And then we looked at a situation where we used channel encoders on both uh, front end and then decoder on the back end. And then we looked at what happens if we do HD encoding before transmitting. 
with and without the channel encoder. And we did this for isolate speech recognition and for communication parameters that cover both QAM and all white Gaussian noise channels. The number of bits that we communicated was kept constant in each of the plots I'm about to show you. So here you can see a comparison between setup one and two, where you have raw data sent versus setup three, where we send HD encoded data. And you can see that pretty much across board, HD encoded data does much better, even in the face of 30% bit error rate. And then we compare to see whether using HD encoding with or without channel coding makes sense. And it turns out that channel coding really doesn't help much. So the message from this is that you can actually get away with using only HD in communication without needing any of the fancy channel coding techniques. And you will still end up with better results in terms of communicating data. And this obviously would apply also for communicating classes and doing uh, federated learning. So we have been, as a team, building uh, HD computing systems because we have been addressing questions that relate to theory, as I showed you a second ago. And we looked at what size hypervectors from theoretical perspective we need. We're also doing some new work that looks at new encoding methods. We have a lot of different applications that we have evaluated. But what I wanna show you next is the implementations that we have for HD computing that run on CPU, GPU, FPGA, and we're measured on those, and that have been accelerated in ASIC and in processing in memory. So for all of these, <clears throat> we use the following setup. Uh, for resistive RAM and ASIC, we actually simulated using 45 nanometer technology. <laughs> but I should mention, that now we have taped out a chip already. It has come back from TSMC in 40 nanometer, and we'll be taping out the next chip in resistive RAM this April. Um, so we'll actually have measurements very soon. So first, uh, doing uh, HD classification and clustering on GPUs works really well. Encoding is super easy because GPUs are basically built for large vector matrix multiplications, which is what you need when you do big encoding. Similarity search and update is also fairly simple. Here on GPU, we simply <laughs> use non-binary data because the GPUs work really well with both integer and floating point. And this allowed us to get a very high speed up but also pretty high accuracy rates. And you can see that here, as compared to CPU, we're about almost 100 times faster and significantly more energy efficient on classification, on clustering, we're a few hundred times faster on GPU. On FPGA, we designed an automated tool that can actually take application code and map it directly into optimized HD-based kernel that runs on an FPGA. You can pretty much pick any Xilinx FPGA, and we're currently working with the team at UIUC on mapping it onto Altera FPGAs as well. And for our classification and clustering measurements, you can see that we're on the order of about 300 times faster and consume, again, significantly less energy. Again, this is going to depend on exactly what dimensionality you pick. For clustering, we're about 46 times faster as compared to k-means. These numbers look a lot better when we look at something uh, clus clustering that is not as simple as k-means, because uh, in hardware, you can get much better speedups for more complex algorithms. This is where things get really exciting. We accelerated training, retraining, and inference for HD computing using resistive RAM. And this is actually going to be in the chip that we will tape out in April. And this turns out is 2,000 times faster compared to the floating point deep neural network implementation that we implemented using exactly the same type of resistive RAM. And as I promised, you can see that we can do approximate search in memory, and we can do it super efficiently with nearly no error uh, that is noticeable. We have also implemented a design in Flash. The reason why we looked at Flash is because we have a lot of truly large data sets. An example would be terabytes worth of data that we use for genomics or that we use for proteomics analysis. 
And the idea was to do HD encoding at the flash plate and then do training, retraining, and inference uh, using a processor that sits on top of the FPGA, uh, sorry, on top of the flash, which is FPGA based. So for this, we were about 11 times faster than FPGA implementation of Insider. And we're, uh, we could uh, need to transfer about 5,000 times less data. So it's pretty impressive, the type of uh, reduction that we can get. So to kind of summarize the kind of efficiency improvements that we can get, we put together a comparison of running on CPU versus GPU, FPGA, and processing in memory. So for <laughs> classification, <coughs> you have measurement results. For GPU, we're almost 200 times faster. For FPGA, we're almost 2,000 times faster. Processing in memory, it's orders of magnitude. Now, processing in memory for both clustering and classification was simulated. The GPU, FPGA, and CPU were measured. And for clustering, you see kind of the similar pattern. We're on the order of about 100 to about 1,000 times faster, depending on what exactly we're looking at. On the FPGA, we're also on the order of about you know, 60 to thousands of times faster. And processing in memory is orders of magnitude faster. And the important thing here is that this was done across all of the workloads I showed you a few slides ago in my experimental setup. And it got same accuracy as state of the art techniques. So accuracy was very comparable. <laughs> so let's look at some of the more recent applications that we have been working on. A lot of uh, recent uh, work that we have done has really focused on seeing can HD computing work at large scale? You know, because much of the publications to date really focused on relatively small data sets. So most recent work here uh, was on looking at using it for recommendation systems. Our early publication that uh, came out a few years back looked at how do we use HD computing for recommender systems. This most recent work really addressed the problem of how do you encode when you have millions of data that need to be encoded. You can't do, do them using standard techniques, which require that you have essentially static matrix vector multiply. Instead, we used hash functions to do this. And it turned out that this worked really well on terabytes of data. So existing methods ran out of steam very quickly, but our hash-based encoding worked really well and could continue to scale well be beyond the terabyte. And most importantly, we were able to get state-of-the-art accuracy for the recommendation systems here. This work was done jointly with Intel. And we also accelerated it, and we found that we're on the order of about 400 times faster um, currently. Uh, another work that recently came out just last year looked at how could we do graph-based learning with hyperdimensional computing. So here <coughs> we take a graph with labeled and unlabeled nodes, and we want to use labeled nodes and information about them to predict what unlabeled nodes might be. For encoding, turns out it doesn't actually matter what we use. Most of it works well. For <clears throat> embedding relationships, it turns out using couple hop neighbors worked best. And then training worked the same way as standard HD computing training. We ran experience, uh, experiments on the GPU using graphical, uh, we compared to graphical convolutional network, graph attention networks, and node 2 back on the data sets that you see here. And you can see that the speed ups that we got range from about 5x to over 2000x. But once we implemented this using ferroelectric FET with ASIC, we found that we could get up to 82,000 times faster as compared to CPU. Um, so this is really a great illustration of uh, how much and dramatically better this work can be. And you can see here the plots that show those results that we ran for both training inference and for also end-to-end -end analysis. We can use this graph-based method to also do symbolic reasoning. So perform, for example, information retrieval from knowledge graphs. And this is something that we're currently working on. We're using a meta QNA data set, 
And we have currently gotten very close to state-of-the-art accuracy by using this similar uh, type of approach. Another interesting result that we got recently was we found that when we have event-based data sets uh, that you would normally use spiking neural networks for, it turns out that using just a single layer of untrained spiking neural network and then training HD computing uh, that uh, takes the features that SNN extracted works actually better than using a fully trained SNN. We found when we implemented this using Loihi and our ASIC that it was about 15 times faster, but we believe we can be a lot faster if we actually implement both on an ASIC. And uh, putting it all together, you can see here for both the DBS-based camera data set and on the bottom right, you see EMG data set, which is the muscle uh, data. Uh, you can see that the blue line, which is our hyperspike design is much more noise resilient and much more accurate than either fully trained SNN with MLP layer or fully trained SNN with variational autoencoders. One of the big issues for HD has been that using classical um, uh, encoding, HD computing has actually not done well on larger size images. It did great on MNIST, but when you look at CFR 100, the results are pretty pathetic. Random projection encoding gives you accuracy of about 9%. So we used this idea uh, that we had in Hyperspike where we took a single layer SNN as a feature extractor to create what we call HDNN, where we can take a small piece of a, co a convolutional neural network, fix that piece as a feature extractor, and then combine it with HD computing, where HD computing is the part that actually gets trained and is adapted to various new types of images. With this approach, we were able to get a state-of-the-art accuracies for both ImageNet and also for CFR 10, 100, and Flowers datasets. So our feature extractor, as I said, will take uh, a piece of a neural network. It actually performs weight clustering, and then it aggregates those weights and simplifies further. So that way we can dramatically reduce the amount of multiply adds that we need to use. So instead of having F times N adds and uh, F times W multiplies, it actually reduces to only N. <clears throat> and as a result, we have parameter reduction that is as high as about 72% and MAC reduction that's also comparable with accuracy that is very, very similar, less than 1% uh, error at most a uh, couple of percent. So we also implemented a much more efficient version of HD computing in an ASIC, which allowed us to scale to arbitrary size the hypervectors that we need to use. So depending on how many classes we had, we could either have more classes with smaller hypervector or less classes with larger hypervector, which allows us to do this dynamic trade-off. This basically means that our current design could process 18,000 MNIST per second, which is pretty impressive. So putting all this together, our HDNN ASIC that just came out from production has a small chunk that's dedicated to feature extractor and the other piece that is dedicated to actual training and learn encoding, learning and training and uh, inference. We're expecting to run an uh, image net at at least 3.2 teraops per watt with accuracy of around 79%. Uh, we, we could actually double this throughput uh, if uh, TSMC would give us twice the area, but we were limited by area, so we had to actually do more pipelining. Okay, we also, turns out, can use this idea of using a feature extractor for few shot learning. The idea is exactly the same as what I showed you. We use a relatively simple uh, CNN-based feature extractor, and then all of the training now focused more on NYK shot training is done by HD computing. So for this, we use slightly different data sets, and we compare to the state-of-the-art baselines, and we implemented it in 40 nanometer uh, resistive RAM uh, technology because that's what we're actually producing in April. 
And you can see that we're able to run uh, 20 times faster as compared to the state of the art with comparable accuracy. But the best news are that, in fact, we can be much more tolerant to errors. So if we have bit error rates that range from 0% to 15%, we can still detect very large majority of images correctly. And this is something that state of the art simply cannot do. Um, so that is what's going to be coming out, uh, as I said, going into production in April. The other piece that we have worked on, which builds on this same idea of uh, feature extraction combined with HD computing, is what we called FHDNN, where we do federated learning with HD computing. The idea here is that we would train uh, on a local data set, and then we would want to uh, share our models. Now, these models are HD based models, so they're essentially just hypervectors that we can send to a central location such as the cloud, or that we could also use to learn in distributed way if we have multiple gateways. The nice thing is that we can get comparable accuracy to Res ResNet, but we are also much faster and more robust to noise. The robustness to noise, you can see, is quite striking here. We have actually deployed this on multiple Raspberry Pis and in uh, covered the area of about 150 square miles of San Diego. All of these Raspberry Pis communicated with UCSD. Latencies obviously varied depending on networking capabilities. And we found that we were about 5x better at communication efficiency, even at this small scale. And you can see that we continue to see much faster convergence and much more robust behavior. This was uh, presented at Mubicom uh, last year. And where we're moving forward is on actually deploying at much larger scale at about 20,000 square miles of San Diego County. And we'll be looking at using a bunch of different types of sensor data to learn on as a part of this large scale sensor network. My team has also worked on secure distributed learning. So here the idea is that we could either encode the data on the client and then encrypt that data and send it to the cloud, which in that case, cloud would have to decrypt the data and then do the training. Or we could do the training locally, encrypt the trained hypervector sent to the cloud and the cloud can learn on that. Or we could also do it at multiple stages. If we have hierarchical network that has sensors, maybe some sensor node cluster heads, maybe then the cloud. And what we found is that our secure HD method was actually 146 times faster than the state-of-the-art Microsoft SEAL library, um, while still providing about the same level of security. And this was published a few years back. Now, what we have done since this is we looked at truly secure computing, using fully homomorphic encryption. The fully homomorphic encryption fully removes the need for decryption. So this means that if I send the data to the cloud to compute on, cloud never decrypts the data. The cloud actually operates on fully encrypted data. The problem with this is that uh, data and operations explode. So integer will turn into about 20 kilobytes and integer multiply will take about 10 million operations instead of just one cycle. So this is a perfect situation for accelerating in memory, which is what we did using one terabyte of resistive RAM. We accelerated both the client and the server, and we compared it to the state-of-the-art neural network accelerated um, fully homomorphic encryption, which used just level uh, style encryption, and which used also lower level of security than uh, our design is capable of. And uh, what we found is that when we compared to them, we were able uh, to run at about 36,000 times higher throughput. And in quote and safe mode, we could run at 15,000 times higher throughput. So this is really pretty incredible. But what's truly amazing is when we combine it with hyperdimensional computing, we estimate that we can get to about a million times faster. And this is because HD computing has this amazing parallelism. So it allows us to really leverage the parallelism that exists in hardware. So um, the other big set of applications that we have worked on is on accelerating various bioinformatics uh, data sets. 
what I'll focus on first is on how do we do genomics and transcriptomics. And in fact, the very first big project that we focused on was accelerating end-to-end -end COVID-19 uh, analysis. This was done jointly with Micron and with Rob Knight and Yema Moshiri at UCSD. When we first started this work, we figured out very quickly that there was a bunch of uh, sequence alignment that needed to happen after the sequences came out of the high throughput sequencing machine. And this also came along with adapter trimming and primer trimming. And this, in fact, is common to all genomics applications. However, this actually took days in January of 2020, which clearly was not acceptable. So we first optimized the pipeline on the CPU, which got it down to hours. In fact, I believe it's about 18 hours um, that they're able to run it on CPU. And then we also looked at the follow-on steps, which are multiple sequence alignment and phylogenetic inference and transmission clustering, which were critical specifically for COVID. So the big piece, the pre-processing and alignment, we accelerated using HD computing and processing in memory. The idea behind HD computing was that we were able to, in fact, encode sequences about the reference sequence. So reference, for example, might be either other COVID-19 virus or it might be a human reference genome. Uh, we can encode that directly into a single hypervector, which allows us to then do comparison of the query sequence, which comes out of the sequencing machine, very rapidly and in parallel. And this is why we were able to get pretty amazing and quick results. We then accelerated uh, this alignment process directly in memory, and we we're able to get results that were on the order of 2,000 times faster than the fastest tool on the CPU, and about 250 times faster than the state-of-the-art FPGA that Illumina sells with their uh, sequence alignment system. We then also looked at uh, how do we do transmission-based clustering, uh, which basically allows us to figure out what mutation is it. And our implementation on FPGA takes only four seconds and consumes 170 times less energy than if we were to run it on CPU. So with those two put together, we were able to support all of the COVID-19 analysis for all of San Diego County. And UCSD, in fact, was the center hub throughout the pandemic. And we have received a number of awards uh, for this uh, work that we have done. We also use the same uh, baseline to do alignment for the microbiome sequences. Again, um, it's exactly the same algorithm. The difference is, is that with microbiome, we actually have to run this twice. Once to clean out the human DNA out of all the samples, and second time to align to bacteria reference genomes. And this is then followed by actually figuring out exactly where uh, the microbiome uh, data is. Now, I'm noticing that I left couple of slides that summarize exciting results that this meant for our COVID-19 analysis. So what I'm really summarizing here is that we went from days to seconds in terms of alignment and that we're able to get seconds for the detection of mutation on FPGA. This gives you, you know, real impact that we got for COVID-19. Uh, we were able to detect days before new um, uh, mutations showed up on campus. We were able to actually detect them in wastewater and warn people to go get tested. This actually meant that UCSD never had to shut down. We were able to continue operating throughout the pandemic. And in fact, uh, it was one of the big reasons why uh, UCSD uh, did as well as we did throughout this whole pandemic. Um, so this actually is where I talk about microbiome. So the first part is the same as with COVID-19, but as I said, there are these two steps. One is to clean out human reference out of it, and the second step is to align to bacteria genome. And then they perform classification as the bottom step. So that's the difference from the um, doing the COVID-19. And for this classification step, we just use standard uh, HD computing classifier, which was all orders of magnitude faster than state-of-the-art CPU tools. 
We also used exactly the same backend for cancer variant detection. Here, again, uh, we actually want to do alignment to the human reference. But after we perform this alignment, what we need to find out is, are there any mutations that are indicative of cancer? So now we're looking for different follow-on tools that do cancer variant detection. The state of the art in this is what's called deep variant, which uses convolutional neural networks. So what it does is it effectively creates an image out of the uh, aligned sequences. It uses different color for each different letter in a sequence. And then it basically looks for variants relative to some baseline. What we did is we accelerated this using our HDNN accelerator, which I already described to you. It worked really well. We ended up with about 200 times higher throughput than GPU, but we think we can do better than this because really these sequences are all character-based. So we think that we can detect these variants much faster using directly HD and the character-based encoding. So, so far I showed you what we did for DNA and RNA sequences. We actually have a nice demo that a student of mine could show you if you were interested, um, that basically demonstrates FPGA that is capable of running all of these applications using the same baseline uh, implementation for HD computing. And I should mention that the single run on a sequencing machine produces terabytes of data. So in, this, in all of these examples, HD was capable of handling very large data sets. The other piece that we have worked on uh, in bioinformatics is looking at mass spectrometry. So here we're using HD computing to accelerate uh, all different uh, segments of mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry uh, effectively gives you information of what kinds of uh, elements are present in your uh, sample. And it shows this to you as uh, essentially a very large bar graph where on x-axis you would have anywhere from 20 to 100,000 bins, and on y-axis you could normalize it to integers that range from zero to about 1,000. <clears throat> when we first started working on this, we discovered that about 60% of runtime went to pre-processing these spectra, to getting them ready for actual processing. So we accelerated that in storage and got it to run about 190 times faster than the state-of-the-art algorithm. And then the other big piece was doing open modification search, which takes the spectra that's been processed and tries to find a match in a database. This database can range, originally when we started this project, it was on the order of about 300 terabytes. Today it's closer to 500 terabytes. So it's growing pretty rapidly. What we're working on currently is accelerating the clustering piece of this. We already have implementation running on GPU that's a few hundred times faster than the state of the art and equally accurate. What we're working on now is accelerating that in storage. So where to next? Um, really, we think that HD computing is perfect for real-time, lightweight, robust, and secure data analytics at scale. We already know that classical hierarchy where we have processor at the top and then increasing amount of latency to memory and storage, this really doesn't work because we end up wasting over 90% of our performance just to moving data around. So what we need is we need to create new intelligent memory and storage systems that can answer when, where, and how to store and process what data that can seamlessly integrate memory, storage, compute, and software, and that can optimize for best performance, power, area, and cost trade-offs. And I think HD computing is a really promising solution for these kinds of systems. It can learn adaptively and fast because of its super fast training and inference. So this means that we can do secure, a lifelong and federated learning at scale, as I showed you. It handles big data really well. I've shown you recommendation systems, mass spectrometry, image processing, and various machine learning algorithm implementations. In fact, we already have state-of-the-art results for most of different classes of machine learning algorithms. It is inherently robust. As you saw in my results, we very easily beat deep neural networks. And uh, what's really exciting is it can efficiently combine 
uh, traditional uh, AI with neurosymbolic reasoning and probabilistic learning while being explainable, which I think is really super exciting uh, part of this. So this is where I'm going to stop uh, for any questions you guys might have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, very much uh, for your talk. So now I open the floor for questions. Maybe, hey, hey, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so who, who was it? Oh, this is someone. Yeah, hi, someone. Yeah, uh, go on, please. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Professor Tatiana. This is a very interesting talk, especially the virus part that you have to find out the, the alert the authorities about this that's super inspiring uh, so home I'm, I'm sorry can you can you uh, increase your mic volume because at least on my end uh, oh. your, your voice is very uh, low better now uh, let's see is it better now yeah i i think so yes yeah, so all I was saying is, Professor Tiana, thank you so much for the talk. And it was very inspiring to see some of your results, especially the COVID-19 one, that uh, you could join the effort to prevent the spread of the virus. That was really cool. Uh, my question to you was, looks like a lot of these improvement factors is coming from processing in memory versus CPU or GPU. And the fact that a lot of this improvement is simply due to the strength of acceleration. So why couldn't we accelerate this, the, the non-SDC parts of it? Uh, did you have any results on that? Or do you know any numbers on that? Um, yeah, yeah, actually, we can accelerate the non-HDC. And in fact, that's what we did, for example, with uh, neural networks. Let me actually fetch the slide on that. Just a second. Uh, the problem is it doesn't accelerate as well. So for neural networks. Oh, sorry, I can't see any slides, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to share it. Uh, it makes it a lot faster if I can kind of skip around. <laughs> so right here, I was showing that we have acceleration about 300 times faster than GPU for neural network using exactly the same uh, type of acceleration as we did for HD computing. But 300 times faster is very different from what I show a little bit later, right in here, thousands of times faster, which we see for HD computing. And the reason why HD does so well in memory is because it has this element-wise operations, which are nat native for memory. Right. Memory is highly parallel. Neural networks don't have this benefit. That's why you can't get this much out of it. Uh, and oh, there, I mean, you can accelerate it on GPU. You get 200 X speed up. That's no joke, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, my message isn't you cannot accelerate it on GPU or FPGA. My message is it's ideally built for in-memory and storage. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is, this was, okay, thank you for this. I didn't notice that number that you mentioned. Earlier. And you can see here head-to-head -head comparison. So this actually compares uh, HD version for the same data set with DNN version for the same data set on the same technology in memory. And HD is 2,000 times faster. And 3.6 times more efficient. Yeah. This okay. is because we got to feed the memory. <laughs> memory consumes energy. So there's a huge difference in speed versus energy efficiency factors. It has to, that actually has to do with um, the fact that memory, you kind of have to keep alive. You can't turn off power to it if you're doing processing, right? <laughs> so, right. so you have some big power that you're consuming regardless for either of them. Got it. And this actually brings me to my, I guess, second question is that, as I understood, it, this is a part of your chip, the slide that you just showed, uh, not, maybe not this one, but the other one. Um, so the chip that we're designing actually has this piece. It has a feature extractor and it has HD encoding. So it's, uh, this is a better slide. So, so the results that you mentioned before, were they from simulations or were they actually from measurements? Um, so let me go back to this. 
back was it? Just missed it. Oh, there. Okay, the white fields in this table are measured. The green field is simulated. Okay, and you also had another slide where you're doing an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, and this, this is yeah. Uh, simulated. Apples to apples is simulated. We, we is didn't have... simulated. Right, but so I, I, see, will I, see, have, so... I will have measurement as you know once the chip is done with being produced. <laughs> oh, so I'll okay. have measurements later this year on resistant rates. And you will be also looking at image type applications that you mentioned in the. And image type applications, I already have measured data uh, in a sense of accuracy has been measured uh, for the algorithm. What I don't have is I don't have measurements on the chip. The chip was, I, ASIC was just produced. Right. right. Like literally uh, at the end of last year and is being packaged currently. But the accuracy is uh, comparable on ImageNet. Okay. So if I'm allowed to, but I would like to have one final question, please. Which is, yeah, sure, go on. Um, as I understand, SD encoding is not a differentiable sort of uh, system, right? But the, new, the neural networks are. So this slide is perfect, actually. So it looks like you're paying the cost of training the entire neural network, taking just the first part of it, and then sort of compressing the model by doing SD encoding thereafter and removing the rest what of the I'm doing system. is something a little bit, uh, 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 a little bit simpler. I'm basically saying that there, there are some patterns in pictures that already pre-trained networks that somebody else trained for something else. They already do this just fine. So I'm basically saying I'm going to use just those little features that this piece of a network uh, can extract for me, and then I'll do training of the HD. So when you say training of the HD, how do you decide the encoding pattern? Are you do you have some sort of differentiating across all the possible encoding? No, for encoding here, we were just using random projection. It was super easy. We did that because a it worked really well. We got good results, and b it's really easy to implement in hardware. Uh, okay, so basically, without those three layers, you will have really bad accuracy. And yeah. if you just include the three pre trained layers, you have almost as good an accuracy so as. Basically, the message is, is that there is something in pre trained network that we need in order to extract the lower end features that current encoding that we have for HD just doesn't do. There yes. may be some pre encoding okay. methods that will work better. But current encoding methods that we have tried just couldn't do it. Okay, I see. So the accuracy yes. is actually not coming from HDC. It's coming from the three. No, series. it's coming kind of from both really, because you cannot get the accuracy from just those three layers of the neural network by itself. For neural network, you need all of the layers to get the accuracy, right? So what we're saying is we can get rid of three quarters of the neural network, right? And we can add just a single layer, which is basically HD layer. We just need to train that one little layer and we get comparable accuracy to a much bigger network. That's a pretty big difference because now I can run this on something that's super tiny. I can run it on a sensor. I don't have to do training on the back end. But, but hold on, you're saying that you're using a pre-trained network. So you could maybe- Yeah, so imagine that somebody gives me Right. A pre-trained network. I'm not actually that picky which network. Right, right, right. So let's say, you know, somebody has trained on CIFR 100. I right. take their network. I take only first few layers. Uh -huh. I do my magic on the first few layers, meaning my magic, is I don't do anything special. I just simplify it. We do a bit of clustering and right. we do a little bit of quantization because that makes it run better in hardware. Then we train only HD, okay? We don't touch the neural network anymore. Yeah, you know? I was wondering- if So can, can I just make a comment? If, if, you, if you look at the VSA webinar from two sessions ago, you'll see IBM uh, did a presentation called Constrained Few Shot Incremental Learning. It's exactly the same architecture yeah. as this. 
if you look at that, they'll explain it all to you. And there's a, a, a nice oh, theory. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's the same idea that we're using also for our few shot learning results. The difference is that we're using HD essentially. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. I didn't catch your name. I'm sorry, sir, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Safon, for questions. So, anybody else, please? Yeah. Can I? Can I just sure, ask? Um, sure, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, have you have you looked at the work that IBM have been doing with Hermes, which is their uh, in memory processor? Because it, it seems very similar to to yeah, what you're doing. I'd just like to understand the differences. Um, so the original IBM work was using primarily phase change memory and could only do inference. Uh, they had not been able to do training. And what we're doing in resistive RAM is we can do training, we can do retraining, we can do inference, and we can do encoding. So we can do the whole process, basically. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, so what, one of the things that they, the big step forward they've made since the early work is that now they can actually, that the actual writing to the chip um, is much more efficient. That was the thing that they were really reporting on. But they, they could only store something like a, a hundred 10 kilobit hyper vectors on the chip. How, how many could you store on your chip? Um, so that's a function of how much area TSMC will give us, basically. <laughs> yeah. But we're planning to run image net size analysis. Okay. So we will be able to show results on image net. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Then sorry again, I have a terrible cold. I actually did better than I expected. <laughs> uh, to Hannah, um, have you uh, considered the uh, NRAM yet? I have not looked at that uh, in great detail, primarily because resistive RAM we know can be produced at larger scale with fairly large densities, uh, which is what we need for larger data sets. So that's why we focused on that. Uh, but we would definitely be very open to other technologies. I've looked at ferroelectric FET, for example, but that you can produce at like 100 bits at a time right now. So it's pretty far off. <laughs> They've made some really interesting project in the last year's period. And I think it's, uh, I'll get a hold of uh, the person that needs to talk to you if that's all right that would be great i would love that so i have to okay, apologize great. i have a meeting that i have to call in actually with ibm <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but uh, glad, i but... i think uh, i think it's a perfect timing to wrap up this webinar so thank you very much diana for joining us today and giving this excellent talk so thank you very much all for joining so i'll see you in two weeks time from now so uh, stay tuned bye bye okay. Bye-bye, Evergeny. Bye, everyone.